This is Death or Prison, brought to you by LeanOnMeUSA.org. This is the Death of Prison podcast, brought to you by LeanOnMeUSA.org. I'm Elmo Golden. And I'm Oswald Nubo. Today we have with us Mr. Ziegler, the Assistant Warden at Everglades Correctional Institution, a.k.a. Buffalo Bill. Why do they call you Buffalo Bill? Being born and raised in Buffalo, New York, big time Buffalo Bills fan. Talk to these guys all day, every day. Well, not that bad, but I let them know, you know, what time it is, especially <laughs> being in Miami. Oh, that's great. Buffalo Bill fan. Of course, I'm a Dolphin. Rivalries. This ought to be good. Warren Ziegler, today we're here to talk about incentivized camp and the work that you do at Everglades. Can you give us a brief description of, of what this institution program entails? What do you offer? Well, the, the, the goal with the incentivized prison concept is to encourage good behavior throughout the state of Florida, the Department of Corrections. So, you know, one of the uh, criteria is to be four years discipline free. So the goal is to get inmates throughout the state of Florida to uh, better themselves, better their conduct so they can be eligible to come to a place like this. So not only did they get to come to a safe place here, but the idea is to get all the other facilities around the state safer as well, because you're gonna have more inmates striving to come to an incentivized prison. So instead of them engaging in whatever behaviors they used to be engaging that were negative and detrimental to their, to their compounds, now you're gonna have a, a abundance more inmates trying to uh, conduct good conduct, stay away from disciplinary reports so they can get to a place like this. One of the incentives is cable TVs. Each dormitory has at least two, if not three TVs in there. They get cable television, which you're not going to see anywhere else. They even get the Sunday tickets, so they get to watch all the football games uh, during football season, mm -hmm. which is a huge plus. You know, they have an incentivized menu. The, the, the menu's a little different. They have incentivized bedding, bigger pillows, bigger mattresses, uh, open compound, open movement. That's something we're working on, you know, continually working on. It's, it's, it's open movement on the compound. Uh, those are the biggest incentives. Uh, we're putting air conditioning in the game room. The game room itself is a big incentive. We got uh, foosball tables in there, air hockey tables in there. Uh, we got PlayStations, video games, uh, Xboxes. We got all the video games in there. Those are things you don't see at other institutions, and those are some of the things that draw guys to come here. We have several uh, programs on the compound. Uh, we're at the point now where we finally got our, each dorm, each, it's got at least one wing that's a dorm program. So the, the, the biggest thing with programs are we have an abundance of programs here, much more than you'll see at any other compound. And it's just across the board. So engagement is high here. That's what I'm hearing. The population right. is engaged in programs. Yeah, we do have a, the, the one thing I see is we do have a lot of engagement with programs, but we do also see that it tends to be the same group of guys, as for the mm -hmm. most part, that are interested in the programs and they kind of cycle through the programs. We do try to encourage uh, interest, uh, a, a broader interest amongst the population, but uh, it does seem to be that it's a, a certain core group of inmates that embrace programs more than others. Mm -hmm. That's one thing we do see. And one thing, uh, one of the challenges we're seeing is as we expand programs to the different dormitories, you know, the housing situation could be an issue, uh, trying to fill the different programs, but we manage it very well and uh, we haven't really had much issues with it, but it can be a challenge housing-wise. Uh, when you're moving a bunch of guys around uh, for different programs, but uh, we manage that well and we haven't had any real issues with that. That brings a question to mind. So if you're having challenges getting some people, it's the same people taking most of the programs. That's what I just heard. So I'm wondering if a person is unwilling to go to programs, this is an incentivized camp, mm -hmm. would they be transferred away to uh, open a bed for somebody who wants to take programs? How does that process adjust some people go to the programs and other people just get to walk around and goof off. Let us, well, let us it's see not, this. It's not a requirement. We can't force right. them. The only program in here that's mandatory is substance abuse, if they're mandated for substance right. abuse. That program, they're required to take. But all the Betterment programs here, all the chapel programs, it's, it's voluntary. So they don't have to come here with a condition you will do programs. We can't force that upon them. A good, thankfully for us, there is a large enough group uh, in our population that's interested in programs. So we're able to fill the programs. But what we do see is when we're trying to put inmates in a certain program, 
They're, they may have already been put in another program, so sometimes it could be a little challenging because it's almost as if the programs are pulling from the same population. Mm -hmm. And so that could be a challenge. Uh, we, we, we do well with it. You know, we recruit, and uh, the inmates sometimes will help us recruit the guys that have been in the programs that have positive things to say about it. They'll help us, and uh, we make it happen. It's not like these programs are void of inmates. We make it happen, but it, at times it could be a challenge. Right. Um, I, I actually had the opportunity to attend a couple of your graduations. So I do know that you have a, a, barber, a barber school here. Right. Um, I know that they, you have, a, a, I guess, the, the dog training program, right. which is important. Tell me a little bit about that. The well, dog program is what these, these dogs are rescued from shelters. You know, it's just, just like we talk about second chance month, these dogs are pretty much given a second chance. Uh, they, they take them out of the shelters before they're euthanized. They bring them here. They get them compatible with humans. They get, they get uh, to, you know, used to interacting with humans. And, and the goal is to get these dogs to the point at the end of the program to get them adopted and basically save them from uh, the environment they were in. The two uh, puppies we got right now, I heard, were found in a Walmart parking lot. Mm -hmm. And they went to a shelter. And if, if the, our program didn't take them in and do what we're doing with them, eventually those puppies could have ended up uh, euthanized. Mm -hmm. So these dogs are brought here. And we have a high success rate with that. Very rarely does a dog get taken out of here due to their, uh, their behavior. Very rarely, once in a great while, but the vast majority of the dogs make it through the training, uh, do very well. And then we have what we call adoption ceremonies in the visiting park where the people adopting the dogs will come and then they'll, they'll take the dogs with them. Amen. That's a huge uh, success. Uh, and and the, the inmates uh, enjoy that uh, as well, interacting with the dogs. You know, a lot of it is, uh, soothing for them or, you know, they enjoy the interaction with the dogs. And I know a lot of the military guys uh, said they liked it too, uh, just being able to interact with the dogs. It was a calming uh, influence for them. Earlier I had asked a question when I was asking about um, incentivized programs, are they required to go or would they be sent away? You know, you and I don't cross paths before in the reentry space on post-release side. So I asked that question. And one thing I know in reentry Guys come out and they say, hey, I need some help. I want a job. And we may ask them, hey, um, what skills do you have? And they'd be like, well, I don't have anything. But you just did 14 years. You didn't take any programs. So the reason I ask that is because from the post-release side, we understand their success in post-release starts pre-release. Right. Right. And that's why I was asking the question I was asking. Can I ask you, you've been, on, you've been in corrections a while. What has been some of the contributing factors you think to guys recidivating when they come back? They come through the system, they get out, they come back. Do you think it's lack of program, behavior, or what's just your consensus based on what you saw with your experience, sir? Well, we have plenty of programs that deal with behavior and attitudes and all that, so I don't really think that's as much as, uh, as the issue. There is a substance abuse element to it. There's a lot of crime we've seen is driven due to substance abuse issues. We have substance abuse programming. We're looking to expand upon our substance abuse program to where it's offered at every institution. Because right now we're targeting a percentage of the guys, but we can't hit all of the guys. But uh, to me, the, that's why the Lifers program, we're gonna to touch upon that later, the Lifers program to me is so successful because the two biggest things I think that need to be addressed is housing and employment. And the Lifers program addresses all that with Noah's outreach. They have the housing there, they take care of the housing, they get them employed, and I think if we can get guys housing and get them employed and, and they can start saving money, they have a much more, a much better chance of being successful. To me, those are the two biggest needs that need to be addressed with substance abuse lagging right behind it with the guys who have substance abuse issues. I, I think that's great, and I totally agree with you. Speaking of housing, and you mentioned a point, the LIFO program and how the guys can have going to housing. Mm -hmm. This is what I have noticed. Let's say someone that's under parole or supervision they tend to be, be open to transitional housing because they have supervision. But then some guys will come out and say, hey, man, I'm free. I don't want to share a room with anybody, but I want housing. And if you come out and you don't have anything, they're not willing to take a sacrifice. So when it comes to housing, housing is rough for a person who has never been in here, right? And I agree housing is a big thing and employment is a big thing. From, but from what I see, Employment opportunities increase with having some type of skill. It don't even have to be a, so we live in a society that's based on certifications, license, and degrees. 
If you want to make decent money, you can't get away from that. Some people could become an entrepreneur and make it, but for the most part, it comes to certifications, licenses, and degrees. And the employment arm is hard out there on the other side without having one of those things. The housing, that's a big thing too. And guess what? We fighting to address that. Even, even my yeah. comrade here deals with, with, with some housing. And, and we agree. We know these things are there, but I'm trying to like find that magical thing. What, how do we inspire these guys to say, hey, I need housing. I'm going to swallow my pride and go in transitional housing so I can save some money, so I could go ahead and be working this job and I can move on and be successful. I'm trying to find out how could we connect the dots for that, sir? Any answers? I know you may not have it, yeah, but, that's, that's but we just yeah. in the think tank. These challenges, but these are the real life mm -hmm. things that our fellow brothers here face coming out. Right. And we, we trying to figure out how could we make re-entry better? How could we even help pre-release better? How could we help make programs inside better? Funding is a big issue. And that, that brings me another thing. Funding. Funding is a big thing with any program. How is that? How is Everglades addressing funding? Do you think it's okay? Or no matter what you got, you work it out however you can. That's what we do. I mean, we, we have a lot of volunteers that will assist us with different things. Our volunteer base here is phenomenal. They, they help us with a lot of things, with donations and, and whatnot, to help us achieve the goals that we want to achieve. And we're blessed to have the volunteers. Uh, you know, we, we have our own internal funding uh, to a degree. Uh, we offer a barbering program. We have a CDL class here. We have a wastewater uh, program that the guys do. Uh, across the street at reentry, they have the electrical and, and the plumbing uh, starting. So, you know, we're expanding. I, I've seen over the years uh, from my DOC career a commitment to programming, uh, vocational programming, because we see that there's a, a need for that. And over the course of the years of my career, I've seen more and more vocational type programmings uh, you know, pop up throughout our institutions, which is very beneficial. Our barbering program, for instance, we've had guys get their license and we've had guys get jobs. We have several success stories where guys are actually working in, as a barber out in the community right now. Those are the type of programs we want to adopt. We want to adopt programs that we know guys can utilize uh, post-release and not just be doing programs just to do programs. I mean, we, we have plenty of programs here, but the programs that really are the most beneficial are the ones that are going to help the guys when they get out. That, that, that's what we're looking for. I know that I've been to uh, maybe two graduations here, and I watch how excited not only the guys are, but also their families to see that their their sons or their husbands are actually getting what Mr. Newbold is talking about, and those are certified um, certificates and also degrees. I know that you have a college or two that comes to this institution now. Awesome. Yes, yes, we have the, uh, the Pell Grant program, Miami-Dade College. That's been a huge success. Uh, the first cohort has already received their associate's degree. I believe it was 18 inmates that received their associate's degree. Many of them have moved on to the bachelor's degree program. We're up to three cohorts here at the main unit. Reentry just came on board with their first cohort. And uh, it's been a huge success. You know, we just had a, a meeting Monday about the... Uh, the uh, Pell Grant program and state residency and all that, because that's one of the challenges they're having is the inmates re, uh, are being able to prove state residency. So we're hoping what we did Monday will help you resolve some of that. And so we'll have more guys that will be able to participate in the Pell Grant program. But uh, that's been a huge success. Miami-Dade College did a phenomenal graduation. They, they really did it mm -hmm. with uh, the whole ceremony, the caps and gowns. It was a phenomenal graduation and it was an awesome sight to see. And we welcome that, and we just continue to look for programs such as that to, uh, uh, you know, give the inmates a, a better chance to succeed uh, once they get out. Any tools we can give them, I tell them that all the time when we're in meetings or I address them. We, our goal is to give them all the tools that they need to be successful, and then it's going to be up to them to use those tools and have the drive and the willpower to 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 make it uh, out there. And I know that um, as as a man that has served time it's important that we, we have those tools when we get out. They're very important for us in order for us to just compete in society. So having incentivized camps throughout the floor, throughout the state, I'm behind that 100%. I know that um, our Secretary of the Department of Corrections, Mr. Dixon, I think that he considers this to be his baby. 
has he ever expressed anything to you about trying to incentivize the whole state? Well, the, the more inmates we see, because like you said, the, the incentivize is, it, it's, it's not mandatory. The inmates have to request it. So the more interest we see in the inmate populations as far as wanting incentivized, uh, the more incentivized prisons I'm sure we're going to open. It's all going to be based upon the number of inmates that want interest and the number of inmates that qualify. That's why we started here with one, and then we want to one in each region. Now we're up to two in each region. And the reason why we're seeing more and more incentivized uh, prisons open up is because there is a, a larger interest amongst the inmate population, and there's enough inmates within the population that, that qualify that enable us to do this. So as long as those numbers keep being there, I'm sure we'll see additional incentivized prisons open in the future, I'm sure. Sounds to me as incentivized prisons are working. If it's having people behavior change at other facilities in order mm -hmm. to get to an incentivized camp, it's, it's being infectious in a good way. And that's what it's all about. And I wanna share something with people who are listening out there. Whether you're a family member, whether you're someone who's incarcerated right now, programs are important. Programs is a big part of our success. Sometimes we feel we don't need a program, but I would say this here, education, programs, trades, all of it work. I sit here at this table right now, but I also been behind the walls and fences, and I would tell you, programs do help. Warden, I thank you for pushing programs, your staff for pushing programs. I thank you for realizing that, working with people with their behavior, because it's hard to make it without having something under your tool belt in terms of skills, something to be employable. And not, not only that, I, and I got to share this, I have seen things where at times we get the education, but we don't want to change our behavior. All of a sudden we get a job and we run into a problem, but we want to handle it like we're on the rec field, but you're in a professional circumstance. So not only do we get the skills, we also need to work on the behavior as we're getting educated in here, because it all ties in together. Warden, as a, again, I've seen you, we cross paths in the reentry space. I think you're doing a great job, and I'm glad to see you steady moving. It gets tough sometimes, but stick to it because we need soldiers like you that's that's yeah. holding down the fort. Just as a, a brief word of encouragement to the guys that are listening, empty out, empty out, and put something in that's going to benefit you, and that's a new program. Uh, the best, our best thinking, as we always say, got us incarcerated, got yeah. us here. And so it may be time to discard some of those things that we've been taught, some of our, even some of our core beliefs that have literally ruined not only our lives, but the lives of others, and start investing in the opportunities that are afforded to us. I'm, I love programs, and I'm gonna tell you guys again, this is the time for you to invest into yourself so that you can be a better person once you're released. I have a question, Elmo, and also for the warden. When we say we have to change some things, does that mean we have to change people, places, and things? I did. <laughs> we must change people, places, and things. We even have to do that inside of facilities. Mm -hmm. the, the crowd, your peer group inside has to change. Even the, the places you hang, we could be in the crowd over here getting into things, or we could be the ones that's got a book going to class. We have to change our thinking, we have to change our places, we have to change our peer group. It all ties in together. So Assistant Warden Ziegler, leave us with something brief that we can, that you would want to not only tell the guys, but tell the, the two million viewers that are about to see what you got. And, and we're in Australia, Canada, we're in parts of Europe, we're throughout this, um, the, the United States. This podcast is, is literally going to go everywhere. If you had just a moment, what would you tell not only the guys, but their families? Right. I would just say that the incentivized prisons are a huge success. Uh, we're, we're to the point now where we have so many programs here. Every single building on the compound, a.m., p.m., evening, we got programs going on, whether it's chapel programs, non-chapel programs. Each dormitory's got at least one wing with a program in it. Uh, the, the programming here is through the roof, and I encourage anybody, uh, within the state of Florida, if they're interested in uh, incentivized, this is a place to be because you'll find at least one program to your liking and uh, that will suit you and, and assist you. 
And what we see here with the inmates is they go from one program to the next to the next, and they cycle through a, a good uh, plenty of uh, majority of the programs. So you'll find yourself a lot to do here. And that's one of the big pushes with us is inmate idleness. Inmate idleness at this place is, is vastly reduced because we have so many guys that are involved and immersed in programs. Their idle time is just not there because they're, they're so uh, immersed into the programs and what, what those programs entail that the inmate idleness, which is a huge uh, issue through, throughout the state, and I'm sure any correctional agency, is to reduce the inmate idleness because you know what idle time is. It's the enemy's workshop. So uh, to have that idleness reduced to the extent that it's reduced here is uh, a huge plus for us. And I just encourage uh, the uh, incentivized uh, concept not only be embraced uh, in the United States, but any, anywhere in the world, any other country, because it's a huge success. Violence is, like I said, next to zero. Idleness is down. Well, they go hand in hand. Uh, the violence, incidents of violence and inmate idleness. So without the idleness, you're not going to see the incident uh, of violence as much. So huge success. I can't say uh, more about it. And I just like to see this uh, concept embraced uh, in a larger scale uh, throughout all correctional agencies. Amen. Amen. Just for a brief moment, uh, I feel the need that we just need to have a quick prayer uh, for the well-being of this institution and also to strengthen the administration here that's doing the work. So Father, we just thank you again for allowing us to be to have this opportunity. We thank you for our brothers that are in blue. We thank you for the men and women that are in this administration that have ch charge over us, have keep over us. We ask that you continue to give them the guide to lead us, Father, to the guide, the, the will to inspire us, Father. And we also ask that you protect them as we go to and fro that we realize that we are one blood and we are one nation and we serve a mighty God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Amen. Warden, you mentioned something about inmate idleness is low, but so are you getting any, what type of things are the guys participating in the program saying? Are you hearing great things, good things, or what you could do differently? Like what type of testimonials are you hearing right now? Well, the biggest thing we get, we get a lot of thank yous uh, from the population for everything we do here, not only from the programs that we have here, but also the events that we have here, like between God Behind Bars, Prison Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Recently, we had Russell Wilson and Sierra come uh, okay. with, with uh, God Behind Bars. We had mm -hmm. Maverick City Music and Kurt Franklin come out last year. We have a lot of high-profile events and high-profile guests. And one thing is the assistant warrant programs. I welcome all that. You know, I've heard at other places they're not as welcoming, perhaps. But I try to, if, if we can do it, I say let's do it. And so that's part of the reason I think why we have a lot of things going on here. We have the programs here, but it's the events as well. We have a lot of events that come in from the outside. And uh, we get a lot of thank yous from the guys while they're here, but sometimes we'll even get a phone call, a guy post-release, want to thank either myself or one of the classification officers. We, we have uh, some staff here that are very dedicated to what they do and very passionate about what they do. And we'll have inmates get out and call up here and thank them uh, for taking a personal interest in, in, the, in the inmate uh, while they're here and, and helping them along the road uh, to be successful uh, on their way out. So. Uh, th th that's uh, the testimonials I've heard. I've heard mostly positive. Uh, occasionally you're going to hear something uh, maybe isn't as positive, but uh, that's, that's rare. Uh, we, we just look and strive to, to keep moving it forward. You know, we always say you know, all things are possible for God you know, mm -hmm. as long as you believe. You know? So mm -hmm. if we can do it, we try to do it. You know, we try to think outside the box. We try to, you know, obviously we have a chain of command. We run everything through the chain of command. And if it's something we can do, we try to make it happen. That's just the way we look at it. You have been listening to the Death of Prison podcast. We're here live at Everglades Correctional Facility. We have the AW here, the System Warden, Mr. Wild Bill Ziegler. We thank you for the opportunity to have us here. This has been the Death of Prison podcast. But around here, we say, Choose life. life.